Welcome to this video on jugulotympanic paraganglioma. Before we begin, consider the following questions. What is a paraganglioma? How do these present? What might be seen on clinical examination? Which investigations are useful in the workup of this condition? How are paragangliomas classified? And which treatment options can be considered in its management? Paragangliomas are benign, slow-growing tumours arising from a type of neuroendocrine cell called a chief cell. Chief cells are found at various locations throughout the body, in close proximity to the autonomic nervous system, hence the term paraganglia. There is a particularly high concentration of chief cells around the carotid and aortic body, where they serve a special chemoreceptive function. These cells are called glomus cells, but not all chief cells are glomus cells. Within the head and neck, chief cells are closely related to branches of the glossopharyngeal and vagal nerves. Tumours of these paraganglia are therefore classified as either carotid body paraganglioma, jugulotympanic paraganglioma, vagal paraganglioma, laryngeal paraganglioma or miscellaneous paraganglioma. As not all chief cells serve a chemoreceptive function, the term paraganglioma correctly replaces older terms such as glomus tumour to describe such lesions. Histologically, paragangliomas are arranged of non-chromaffin staining chief cells arranged in clusters known as cell barlin. The majority are benign and non-secretory, though up to 5% secrete catecholamines. Jugular tympanic paragangliomas are slow-growing tumours which arise from the paraganglia related to Jacobson's nerve Arnold's nerve, the tympanic plexus or the jugular bulb. Depending on where these tumours arise, the presentation can vary. These tumours are typically slow growing, but are locally destructive and can destroy significant amounts of bone. Due to their slow growth, they may be detected incidentally, though they may present with pulsatile tinnitus, a conductive hearing loss, or if they extend to neurovascular foramina, may result in lower cranial neuropathies. Catecholamine secreting tumours may present with uncontrolled hypertension, palpitations and persistent headaches. A number of eponymous signs may be present in a patient with a paraganglioma. These include the rising sun sign, brown sign and aquino sign. The rising sun sign describes the reddish hue seen on otoscopy behind the eardrum as a hypotympanic paraganglioma extends superiorly into the mesotympanum giving an appearance similar to a rising sun. Brown sign describes blanching of the red mesotympanic mass when performing pneumatic otoscopy with the seagull speculum. And Aquino sign describes a reduction in pulsatility of the mass when compression is applied to the carotid. A full assessment should also be performed of the lower cranial nerves to assess for any subtle cranial neuropathies. As these lesions are slow growing, Neuropathies can be subtle and not noticed by the patient themselves. Vernet syndrome describes a deficit of cranial nerve 9, 10 and 11, while Villaret syndrome describes an additional neuropathy of cranial nerve 12 along with a Horner syndrome and or some facial nerve deficits. A suspected paraganglioma should be investigated with a high resolution CT scan of the temporal bones along with a contrast enhanced MRI scan. The CT may show erosion of the carotigo-jugular spine with moth-eaten appearances of the bone surrounding the lesion. An MRI would show heterogeneous appearances called a salt and pepper appearance seen readily on T1-weighted images. Patients with suspected paraganglioma should also have a whole-body dotatate PET scan to assess for any synchronous neuroendocrine tumours elsewhere. In addition, as 2-5% of head and neck paragangliomas may secrete catecholamines, a 24-hour urine catecholamine assay should be requested. Finally, as paraganglioma can be associated with multiple genetic conditions such as MEN type 2, von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, neurofibromatosis type 1, and familial paraganglioma syndrome, molecular genetic testing should be requested, and familial screening being offered to any high-risk groups. Jugular tympanic paragangliomas can be staged according to the Glasscock-Jackson or FISH staging systems. The FISH staging system progresses from type A to type D stages, where type A describes a tumour 
confined to the middle ear cleft. A type B tumour is one that extends from the middle ear to the mastoid. Type C describes lesions that involve the carotid and is subdivided into C1 to 4, where C1 describes those affecting the carotid foramen, with C4 describing lesions extending beyond the petrous apex involving the paraclival area and infratemporal fossa. Type D lesions describe those which have an intracranial extension and are subdivided into D1, 2 and 3, where D1 describes a less than 2 cm intracranial extension and D3 describes an unresectable intracranial tumour. Paragangliomas should be managed as part of a dedicated multidisciplinary team, with the results of the above investigations and staging being used to inform the management. The primary treatment goal is long-term preservation of function, with conservative management being the first choice for most tumours. Stereotactic radiosurgery is a safe and effective treatment for growing tumours, and in limited cases, there is a role for surgery. While historically a gross total resection was considered the gold standard, due to the high risk of worsening cranial neuropathies, this is not favoured for the majority of cases. Gross total resection may be more feasible and appropriate for type A tumours, whereas for larger tumours, a subtotal or limited resection may be more appropriate, with a view to provide adjuvant stereotactic radiosurgery for the residual tumour. Prior to surgery, preoperative embolization of the ascending pharyngeal or occipital arteries can be considered to reduce intraoperative blood loss. The MDT therefore considers a combination of factors, including tumour-related factors, along with patient factors, including their preferences, when recommending the best course of action. I hope you found this video to be useful. Please consider subscribing and let us know what you'd like us to cover next.